Well, I had several emails from Stuart saying how excited he was at being here, and then I got one saying how very, very disappointed he was not to be able to come. And, uh, but he just felt he couldn't get onto the plane. We all know what flu can be like. And um, so I'm sure I send you his very best wishes and apologies and everything. Uh, like Susan said, it's the first time I've talked in a tent. I feel this ought to be a revivalist movement. <laughs> Perhaps we could do some <laughs> reviving at the end. Um, there are some pretty pictures because Stuart's far more good looking than I am. So there's something for you to look at and I hope that I can make this as coherent as possible. Um, a series of tragic and violent episodes among volatile ap apocalyptic movements in the decade leading up to the new millennium has generated a renewed interest among scholars in locating the source or causes of collected religious violence. And now we've got quite a few pictures. Um, this is the Branch Davidians at Waco. There they are being burnt down. That's the compound after the FBI had done their damage. Um, that's the solar temple that Susan told us about. That's still the solar temple, I think. And that too. Yeah. Um, is that Luc, Luc Jura? Jure. Um, that's Om Shinrikyo, the Tokyo undergr um, underground where the sarin gas was set off before the Syrians got hold of it. Um, that's Ashahara, head of Om Shinrikyo. That looks like Heaven's Gate, where they all committed suicide by drinking um, nasty stuff. That's their leader and the bodies in San Diego. That's their website. This is the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. This, you may remember, was in Uganda, where a whole lot of people were locked up in the church and burnt, and then they found a whole lot of other bodies. Um, I think that was in the year 2000. That's their recovering the burnt remains. And I think those are probably the pastors. It was sort of offshoot of a Catholic church. So that's Stuart's beginning. The same clustering of incidents also spurred deepening concerns in the general public, as some critics worried that this might reflect a new or growing trend but millenarian violence, of course, is nothing new. As the religious historian Robert Fogarty notes, there has been a long history of millennial expectations, prophetic utterances and outlandish activities that have resulted in both confrontations and destructive behaviour. We can point to numerous examples in history. There were the Jewish... Um, uh, there we go. The Jewish militants at Masada, the early Anabaptists, Thomas Munzer, and the Reformation Protestants, the violent Circumcilian fringe of the Donatist church matters in antiquity, and the mass suicides among the old Russian believers at the end of the 17th century, to name just a few. John Hall and others observe that millenarian and apo can't say this, apocalyptic movements can often become intertwined with broad historical currents. Poor people's movements of redemption, crusades against the infidels, revolutionary movements against an established order, and so on. The focus of this paper is to explore systematically factors that may affect the trajectory of violence in millenarian movements. Why do some religious groups move towards violence? What are the common variables or factors that they might share? 
Are there similar external, social, cultural, or political conditions that millenarian groups encounter, which might increase the likelihood of collective violence? Before proceeding with this analysis, some definitions are in order. In sociological terms, and he's quoting Meredith Maguire here, millenarianism refers to the expectation <coughs> of an imminent collapse of the entire social order and its replacement with a perfect new order, which fits in rather with what Joe was saying earlier. The definition is intended to be sufficiently broad so as to include secular millenarian groups or movements, nationalist movements, Marxist movements, and radical environmentalist movements. But we're concerned here primarily with religious millenarian movements. Because millenarianism entails the expectation of the disintegration of the old social order, it's inextricably tied to apocalypse you all know what I mean. Apocalypticism. Apocalypse literally means the revealing. In a religious context, it refers to the revelation of Christ in the second coming amidst the cataclysmic end of the world. This paper builds on some previous work of other scholars, David Bromley, John Hall, Jim Richardson, Thomas Collins, Dick Anthony, and Catherine Wessinger. The paper is both a survey of the existent research literature on collective religious violence and an attempt to expand on this body of scholarship. Tom Robbins and Dick Anthony, in their examination of sectarian violence following the Branch Davidian siege and standoff, offer a breakdown of factors into two broad categories, endogenous and exogenous. The former, endogenous, denotes properties of a movement, its leadership, beliefs, rituals, and organization. The latter, that's the exogenous, include factors related to the hostility, to hostility, stigmatization, and persecution that religious outsiders often receive at the hands of forces in the social environment in which they operate. The authors concede that the distinction may be largely analytical. Endogenous and exogenous variables are interrelated. Curiously, though, Robbins and Anthony focus primarily on endogenous conditions and processes that enhance volatility and potential for violence, only giving a perfunctory nod to exogenous variables. I, Stuart, right, see this as a problem, but he'll return to this issue shortly. According to Robbins and Anthony, pertinent endogenous factors may be tentatively grouped under three headings. First, factors related to the consequences of apocalyptic beliefs and fervent millenarian expectations, millennial expectations. Secondly, factors related to the nature and characteristic volatility of charismatic leadership. And thirdly, residual factors that are mostly loosely interrelated, but that might be viewed as relating to the significance of some social movements as communal ideological systems with boundaries. They go on to say that these headings do not denote single variables, but ensembles of variables. Stuart wants to briefly examine these three factors. Apocalyptic beliefs encourage volatility and enhance the likelihood of violence because the perceived imminence of the last days relativizes conventional norms and rules. Apocalyptic visions have inherent antinomian implications. Specifically, apocalyptic movements often anticipate that a climate of violence will accompany the last days and that persecution will be directed against the saints or the spiritual vanguard of the movement. Therefore, they must prepare themselves to defend their enclave, to survive, to inherit the earth. 
a defensive or survivalist orientation might crystallize. Apocalypticism can also generate paranoid anxieties and fierce antipathy towards the ungodly. If tensions arise with the host culture, this may be interpreted as a form of persecution. The antipathy towards worldly institutions and the unrightless involving what Wallace calls world-rejecting sects may indeed incite antagonism. Here we can anticipate an upward spiral of contention wherein religious rejection of the state and secular society encourages enmity and hostility, leading to persecution, in turn reinforcing antipathy toward human institutions, and so on. Anthony and Robin's second endogenous factor is charismatic leadership. Charismatic authority, they argue, embodies a number of conditions that may affect the volatility and potential violence of religious movements. Charismatic authority is a hallmark, almost by definition, of non-traditional, particularly first-generation movements that partake of whatever instability is associated with violence. Charismatic leadership is fundamentally precarious. The responses that charismatic leaders make to perceived threats will often tend to embellish their authority toward a more extreme direction. Jim Jones of the People's Temple in Jonestown, Guyana, required frequent tests of faith and commitment, signing false confessions, suffering public humiliations, drinking the cool aid. Other charismatic leaders, Chuck Dederich, Shoko Ashahara, have used these kinds of tests to purge members who were not completely committed, thus directly or indirectly, preparing for future violence as the leader consolidated a disciplined cadre of devotees. The formation of charismatic leadership too often operates to intensify a basic definitional quality, that is the absence of accountability and the restraints on impulsivity. Both of these characteristics increase group volatility. The charismatic leader will be tempted to use his or her authority to eliminate sources of dissension, dissonance and criticism. The result is what Robert Lifton calls the deification of idiosyncrasy. The third endogenous factor may be succinctly described as boundary control. Millenarian movements or sects maintain a dimension of boundary control. Some are separatist movements, but they seek to protect the group from external threats. Most outbreaks of violence associated with religious movements, they argue, entail escalating boundary tension. His next subheading heading is um, expanding on exogenous factors. Although Robbins and Anthony don't provide much in the way of discussion or analysis on this last factor, it's precisely here that I think the arguments invite a closer examination. I want to use this opportunity to segue into an extended analysis of exogenous factors. Endogenous factors speak to the internal aspects of the group but there are limitations to collective, locating collective violence solely or even primarily in the qualities or characteristics of the group itself. There is certainly a tendency among opponents of marginalised religious movements to psychologise putative causes of collective religious violence. But as John Hall and colleagues astutely point out, George Simmel observed long ago that conflict is by itself nature, sorry, by its nature, social. Conflict is by its nature social. It necessarily involves at least two parties. Now conflict can arise within a group 
among two people or even two factions. But history suggests that such intergroup conflict among religious communities is most likely to lead to schism, not collective violence. In extending and clarifying an analysis of exogenous factors, it's essential to understand that collective religious violence is often the product of interaction between the millenarian movement and opponents in the larger society who are contesting the movement's cultural legitimacy to pursue its mission and vision. Hall and others offer a critically important insight in this regard. The apocalyptic solidarity of the group, though important, doesn't in itself explain extreme violence. Rather, such violence grows out of escalating social confrontations between, on the one hand, an apocalyptic religious movement and, on the other hand, ideological proponents of an established social order who seek to control cults through emergent, loosely institutionalised, oppositional alliances. In the modern context, oppositional alliances are formed typically starting with core opponents. These include disgruntled ex-members or apostates, and he's using David Romley's concept of apostates as one who has not simply left the group, but who is actively engaged in debilitation or destruction of their former group. The anti-cult movement, anti-cult movement organizations and actors, and possibly concerned relatives or friends. Whether social con conflict has violent consequences often depends on the degree to which the core opponents are successful in mobilizing institutional allies in a moral campaign to expose discomfort or eradicate the religious movement in question. Key institutional allies would include first news reporters who adopt the anti-cult or adversarial framing of opponents and perpetuate a victimization narrative that casts the religious movement as a dangerous threat to members of the host society. And secondly, state agents acting on these threat attributions so that the partisan goals and interests of core opponents are subsumed as state interests in exercising social control. Now, even with the presence of these variables in high tension conditions, we must note that incidents of collective religious violence are still extremely rare. While we can point to a cluster of incidents of collective religious violence in the last decade before the new millennium, we must remember that there were thousands of religious groups holding apocalyptic beliefs in the 1990s that did not experience any violence. We are looking at a minuscule fraction of a population. And his next heading is exogenous factors affecting trajectories of violence. It's axiomatic to say that trajectories of religious violence are variable and contingent on conditions of interaction. And here he wants to draw on the analytical framework of contentious politics in social movement theory. Trajectories of contention between or among groups may take many paths. They are difficult to predict because the driving force in their progression involves the interaction of the parties in contention. One must take into account patterns of moves and counter moves among groups over contested terrain. We must identify the social processes and mechanisms by which disputes and conflict between groups become broadened, what Bromley calls dispute broadening. Issues are strategically framed, perceived threats are attributed, and political opportunities are seized by challengers, opponents, state actors, and third parties. Apocalyptic and millenarian movements, more often than not, 
find themselves facing critics, opponents, and state and or institutional actors who challenge their cultural legitimacy. In this matter, the parties in contention may create a reciprocal interlocking helix of escalating conflict that shapes and builds the trajectory of contention with the possibility of culminating in violence. So the pathways of contention are not fixed, they are not deterministic. The trajectory of violence in the millenarian movement even when the movement possesses all the endogenous characteristics previously described, cannot be known or predicted without taking into account the interactions of other parties in contention. Of all parties, state, of course, plays a pivotal role because they can lay claim to the legitimate use of force against groups they believe pose a threat to the social order. If opponents of, a millenarian, of millenarian movements are successful in claims-making activities or deviance amplification, persuading state agents that the movement poses a danger to its members and the surrounding society, the result may entail use of force actions by the state that involve violence and or provoke violence from the targeted religious group. And here he wants to turn to the case of the Branch Davidians. It's commonly seen or heard in media accounts and in statements by institutional or political leaders that the Branch Davidians died in a mass suicide engineered by a crazy cult leader, David Koresh. His own research on this movement and the federal siege leads him to a very different conclusion. He contends that the cataclysmic incident was contingent on the actions of federal agents, beginning with the ATF, which developed an inflated marital, sorry, martial, an inflated martial image of the group as a violent apocalyptic cult bent on war with the government. This helps to explain the massive paramilitary siege by the ATF's special response team, which requested and received military assistance, combat and air support, FLIR, I don't know what that stands for, FLIR? Forward looking in for something. Forward looking in for something. Thank you, Susan. Well, that's three quarters of the way there. What? Ah, right. Yeah, good. Thank you. That surveillance and overflights and training in close quarters combat and use of force takedown techniques at Fort Hood military base for three days prior to the raid. Perhaps even more importantly, this inflated martial image did not develop in a vacuum. The core opponents of David Koresh played a critical role in fashioning a warfare narrative, making exaggerated and erroneous claims that the Davidians were a paramilitary group that brainwashed its members, were amassing a stockpile of weapons and bomb-making materials in preparation for Armageddon, had plans to blow up a dam on Lake Waco, posted armed guards 24-7 round the buildings with shoot-to-kill orders, and were linked to other violent extremist groups, such as Posse Comitatus and Christian Identity. While these, troops were clear, while these tropes were clearly exaggerated, federal investigators developed this threat assessment based solely on the narratives of opponents and failed to take into account that their sources were neither objective nor impartial a stinging criticism which later appeared in two separate government reports. There is evidence that the received warfare narrative of core opponents also served the interests of an opportunistic government agency. Stu argues elsewhere that the ATF launched a high-profile raid in hopes that it would create favourable news coverage 
just prior to budget and appropriation hearings in Washington. The raid was launched on February the 28th, and by March the 15th, two weeks later, ATF Director Stephen Higgins was testifying in appropriations hearings before congressional subcommittees, requesting increased funding to combat violent anti-government groups and their growing firepower. Seeing the new Clinton administration's push for tighter gun control as a reversal of the previous administration, the Reagan-Bush administration, of pro-gun policies, it's quite likely that ATF officials recognized a political opportunity. <coughs> and Stu contends that ATF investigators and officials framed the information they received to fit the narrative of warfare causing them to overlook or ignore contradictory, conflicting, or ambivalent evidence. This explains the puzzling decisions by ATF officials who failed to consider less lethal opportunities as they arose in what the Treasury report referred to as steps taken along what seemed at the time a preordained robe. Moreover, the ATF was so intent on a military-style raid that it manufactured a false drug nexus that allowed the Bureau to secure military training and assistance in the planning and execution of the raid. Under US federal law, civilian law enforcement may only receive military support in the enforcement of domestic law when evidence of a drug nexus is shown. According to a congressional investigative report, ATF agents misrepresented to Defense Department officials that the Branch Davidians were involved in illegal drug manufacturing. As a result of this deception, the ATF was able to obtain some training from forces which would not otherwise have provided it, and likely obtained other training within a shorter period of time than might otherwise have been available. The strategic framing of the Branch Davidians as a dangerous cult may be understood in terms of this threat attribution and is consistent with the analytic framework of contentious politics. Similarly, the seizing of an emergent political opportunity aptly describes the actions of the ATF. Herein we can see how quote, a potent script emerged from a convergence of narratives among cultural opponents of Koresh, allied with public agencies that served to consolidate the mutual interests of both law enforcement and Davidian antagonists. Now, to be clear, the incidents of collective religious violence among apocalyptic movements we have identified in the decades before the term of the millennia are quite different from each other in important ways. They involve different religious traditions, different membership profiles, differences in education, social status, culture, and geography. Even the outcomes, which ostensibly appear to be the same, are quite varied. But more often than not, these incidents share a common exogenous feature. They were engaged in escalating conflict with opponents and detractors. Space does not permit a detailed analysis, but in the case of the People's Temple, Branch Davidians, Order of the Solar Temple, Om Shinrikyo, and the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments, we can find an element of an upward spiral of conflict between movement leaders and opponents that affect or shape a trajectory that affect or shape a trajectory of violence. Now, because trajectories of religious violence are variable and contingent on exogenous conditions of interaction, as well as endogenous factors of volatility, we have variations in the outcomes. 
but there are some common or general features we can identify. First, within the orbit of movement leadership, there's a gradual consolidation of belief that the movement's cultural legitimacy to pursue its mission, vision, mission and vision is being threatened, and this shared perception is defined as an existential threat. Secondly, because apocalyptic beliefs can generate paranoid anxieties and fierce antipathy towards world worldly institutions and the ungodly, dispute broadening actions are taken by opponents that are taken by opponents are seen as confirming the movement's beliefs that their capacity to exist as an autonomous collective is imperiled. Apocalyptic remedies may be constructed or expanded. Thirdly, to the degree that state agents act or are perceived as acting in concert with opponents to challenge, discredit and eradicate the faithful, their upward spiral of conflict gives increased justification and prophetic meaning to possible violence. Conflicts between millenarian movements and external movements are cast as a cosmic or Manichaean struggle between the forces of good and evil. The faithful may believe they are being tested by God in some kind of end time scenario in which they may have to die or be killed as the saints and martyrs who have come, become before them. They may prefer death over capture and enslavement by the wicked or unrighteous, the whore of Babylon, the Antichrist, the beast, or whichever symbol or embodiment of evil is culturally appropriated by the movement. Herein we find the seedbed of martyrdom. These acts of collective violence in the context described above, involving escalating tensions with opponents, are not seen as mass suicide or homicide or otherworldly labels. They are defined as desperate and defiant acts of faith in the face of threatened extinction, real or perceived. Let me end with this anecdote, he writes. Stu has taught a course in terrorism for the last 15 years at his institution. He spends about a third of the course on religiously motivated terrorism. And he uses Mark Jürgensmeyer's book, Terror of, in the Mind of God. In one section, Jürgensmeyer records an interview with Abdul Aziz Rantisi, one of the, co -founder, one of the founders of Hamas. During the course of the interview, Jürgensmeyer asks a question about the use of suicide bombings. And TC recoils and corrects the interviewer. We prefer another term, Rantisi says, an Arabic word, intishadi. It means self-chosen martyrdom. The correct phrase for suicide bombing campaigns was also alternatively defined by Rancini as martyrdom operations. The idea of the suicide bomber implies an impulsive act by a deranged individual, Rantisi said. The self-chosen martyrdom undertaken by young men in the Hamas cadre were ones carefully chosen as a part of their religious obligation. And so it appears, as with other concepts in our field of experience, such as beauty or pornography, that contested terms such as martyrdom or mass suicide are truly in the eyes of the beholder. And he thanks you. Thank you so much, Eileen.